This is Michael Altos, and we're talking about pulmonary physiology. This is recording part four. I'd like to take a little detour for a moment and talk about the four most important equations in clinical practice. This is a little module that was written by Lawrence Martin, a well-known pulmonologist. He has a wonderful website, which is very interesting, and I refer you to it here. He's written some very interesting books as well, both about clinical medicine and pulmonology and non-clinical topics as well. The first of Dr. Martin's four equations is the PaCO2 equation. In its simplest form, it says that the PaCO2, the arterial partial pressure of CO2, is proportional to V dot CO2 divided by V dot A. V dot CO2 is CO2 production by the body in milliliters per minute. V dot A is alveolar ventilation in liters per minute. This is simply the entire minute ventilation, which is respiratory rate times tidal volume, and then subtracting away the dead space ventilation, that portion of the ventilation that goes to dead space. This equation shows us two things. First of all, it shows us that the amount of CO2 in the blood is directly proportional to the amount of CO2 being produced by your metabolism. This is pretty obvious, but it tells us that you can never know a patient's PaCO2 just by clinically examining them, because you don't really know what their CO2 production is. The only way to know the PaCO2 is to measure it with a blood gas. The other thing this equation shows us is that there is a relationship between ventilation and PCO2. Specifically, the amount of CO2 in the blood is inversely proportional to the alveolar ventilation. And you've seen this in the operating room. If we increase minute ventilation by increasing tidal volume or respiratory rate, the CO2 goes down. Therefore, if a patient has hypercapnia and elevated PaCO2, it must be due to inadequate ventilation or too much dead space ventilation. What about increased production of CO2? It turns out this is a pretty uncommon cause of hypercapnia, and it's not usually a problem in healthy lungs. However, if you ever have a patient with an abnormally low PaCO2, in a patient who's having anaphylactic shock or a cardiac arrest, that would be caused by decreased metabolism if the body is no longer getting perfusion. PaCO2 is important because hypercapnia carries a lot of danger. As we'll see in a few minutes, when your PaCO2 goes up, it lowers your PaO2. When your PaCO2 goes up, it lowers your pH and makes you acidotic. And as the graph on the right shows, once as your baseline PaCO2 gets higher and higher, the more it will rise for a given drop in alveolar ventilation. Here's a patient with a normal PaCO2 of 40, and we'll just look at this one curve on the left here. And so that corresponds to a minute ventilation of about 5 liters per minute. If we drop their minute ventilation, we see a very steep rise in PCO2. On the other hand, here's a patient who's hyperventilating. They have a PaCO2 of 20, which is very low, at a minute ventilation of about 10 liters per minute. And cutting their respiratory, they're cutting their uh, minute ventilation in half leads to a relatively small increase in PaCO2. The second equation is the Henderson Hasselbalch equation. In its simplest form, it says that pH is proportional to the bicarbonate concentration divided by the PaCO2. What this equation tells us is that the acidity of the blood depends on respiratory and or metabolic acid base management. If any of these three variables is abnormal, there must be some sort of acid base disturbance. And as we will see later on in the renal section, we can determine the primary disorder and the compensatory change. So we'll come back to this equation in much more detail next semester. The third equation is the alveolar gas equation. This relatively complicated looking equation 
tells us about the oxygen side of things, and we're going to analyze it in some detail. Let's just define our terms here. We have PaO2, this is a capital A, and it stands for alveolar. We have FiO2, the fraction of inspired oxygen. We have PB, which is barometric pressure, and we're going to correct that by subtracting away PH2O, which is the water vapor pressure, the partial pressure of water vapor, which is always 47 millimeters of mercury. We also have P lowercase a CO2, the arterial PCO2. And finally, we have this number 0 0.8, which is called the respiratory quotient or the respiratory exchange ratio. It quantifies how much CO2 is made for every molecule of oxygen that you take in. It's not actually a one-to-one -one ratio. It's usually about 0 0.8, but that depends on the patient's diet and also is affected by the FiO2. If we just look at this equation in broad strokes first, what do we see? If I hold FiO2 constant and I let PaCO2 increase, then PaO2 is going to decrease. In other words, hypercapnia causes hypoxia. Second of all, if I let FiO2 decrease, the PaO2 will also decrease. That tells me that suffocation, low FiO2, causes hypoxia. And finally, if I let barometric pressure decrease while holding the other variables constant, I see that PaO2 decreases. So high altitude causes hypoxia. Now let's analyze this equation in a little bit more detail. What's really going on here is that the alveolar PO2, which is actually something difficult for us to measure directly, can be calculated by looking at the inspired oxygen minus the consumed oxygen. Now, why do we care about alveolar PO2? And the answer is because it lets us calculate what people call the AA gradient or the AA difference. It's not really a gradient, but it's the difference between the P big AO2, the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen, and the P little AO2, the arterial partial pressure of oxygen. Why do I want to know this AA difference? It can tell us if the lungs are properly transferring oxygen to the blood. And it can tell us the clinical significance of a given PaO2, lowercase arterial partial pressure of oxygen. If a patient has a normal AA difference, and they have normal gas exchange, and they're on room air, we expect this value to be either 8 plus, or 8 plus 0.2 times their age in years, or some will say age divided by 4 plus 4. In general, for a young person breathing room air, we expect to see an AA difference of around 10. As a patient gets older, the AA difference increases, about a millimeter of mercury per decade after age 40. So you can see an elderly patient, instead of 7, I expect their AA difference to be more like 14 or 15. As FiO2 increases, the AA difference also increases, about 5 to 7 millimeters of mercury for every 10% increase in FiO2. So if I put a young, healthy person on 100% oxygen, their normal AA difference will be more like 30 instead of 7, and an elderly person will be more like 50 or 60 instead of 14 or 15. So how do I use this information? Usually when the AA difference is elevated, when it's abnormally large, there is a problem with gas exchange. There's a VQ mismatch. There's some sort of right to left shunt. Does dead space like a PE increase the AA difference? It can, but it doesn't always. And so that's one common cause of increased AA difference. Another would be a diffusion defect. That's less common. A patient may also have increased oxygen extraction, which would lead to a decreased uh, SVO2, venous oxygen saturation. This would occur in a patient who has severe anemia or a hypermetabolic state or very low cardiac output. One place where we don't expect the AA difference to be changed is in patients who are hypoxic because of hypoventilation or because of low FiO2. And so I think the bottom line here is we're going to spend a lot of time next semester talking about acid-base, 
and CO2 and bicarb, and everybody is going to learn those equations, but it's easy to neglect the oxygen side of a blood gas. And when you get a blood gas and you get a PaO2, using the alveolar gas equation will help us evaluate a hypoxic patient and help us understand if there's a problem with gas exchange in a patient who has an abnormally elevated AA difference. The last equation is the oxygen content equation. How much oxygen is in the blood? This equation has two parts, the oxygen saturation times 1.34 times the hemoglobin, and then 0 0.003 times the PaO2. What do these mean? The first term tells us that pretty much all the oxygen in your blood is bound to hemoglobin. SaO2 is the saturation. What percent saturated is the hemoglobin? 1.34 is how much oxygen can bind to each gram of hemoglobin. And then your hemoglobin concentration is just the concentration of hemoglobin in the blood. This tells you how many milliliters of oxygen are bound to hemoglobin. And that's virtually all of it. A little bit of oxygen dissolves in the blood with a solubility coefficient of only 0 0.003 milliliters of oxygen per millimeter of mercury of oxygen in the PO2. So this makes up a very small component, except at very, very high FiO2. The CaO2 is very important because it tells us how much oxygen is actually in the body to be potentially delivered to tissues. I just want to add on one other little module in this uh, recording here. I'd like to talk about, very briefly, control of breathing. Our brain has a respiratory center, and it's located in the brainstem, in the medulla and in the pons. It's interesting because uh, breathing is one of those functions that we can completely control voluntarily, or we can completely control involuntarily. The involuntary center is here in the brainstem. It takes in sensation from the glossopharyngeal and the vagus nerves, which transmit information from all sorts of different chemoreceptors and baroreceptors and stretch receptors in the lungs. And this information is used to drive our involuntary control of breathing. One example is the Herring-Brewer reflex, which says that overinflation of the lungs will stop further inspiration. So all of this information is processed here in the brainstem. It takes this information and it creates repetitive bursts of signals that control the basic rhythm of respiration. And by respiration, I really mean inspiration, because we saw that expiration is almost always done passively. When you're sleeping or focusing on something and not your breathing, your brain stimulates inspiration and then it stops and you passively expire. It controls the depth and the frequency of respiration. And it only stimulates muscles of expiration if you need high levels of ventilation. So if you start, uh, if you gave somebody some CO2 to breathe, just a couple percent CO2, it would make your brain go wild. And you would start breathing 20, 25 times a minute. And at that point, you'd probably have your expiratory muscles start pushing air out so you could get that next breath in faster. Similarly with exercise, which is also a buildup of CO2, you have that panting where you're actually pushing to breathe the air out. So at rest, we're really just controlling inspiration, but under certain conditions, even expiration can be stimulated by the brainstem as well. Specifically, what's going on chemically here? Well, the goal, as we know, is to maintain normal levels of PCO2, of PO2, and hydrogen ion. CO2 and hydrogen ion have a direct effect on the respiratory center, and oxygen has a slightly more indirect effect over there. So when your CO2 and your, H and your hydrogen ion levels increase, your brainstem, your medulla, has a chemosensitive area that can detect these changes in CO2 or changes in uh, hydrogen ion, and it stimulates increased alveolar ventilation. Hypoxia is detected more by peripheral chemoreceptors, which are in your carotid and your aortic bodies, and they're less sensitive. Your PO2 has to drop below 100, and really, it has to drop quite a bit, like in the range of 30 to 60, before your hypoxic drive really takes over.
If a patient becomes hy acutely hypoxic, the brain will be stimulated to hyperventilate and you'll become um, hypocapnic. You'll decrease your PCO2 as a result. But patients who have lung disease and become chronically, gradually hypoxic will become acclimatized to their low PO2 levels. And so they won't become hypocapnic. Their CO2 levels won't drop and they'll continue to increase their alveolar ventilation. There are certain conditions that can affect your ability to control your breathing. One example would be brain edema. If the brain sustains some sort of trauma and starts to swell, you could block supply of blood to the, um, to the brain and this would affect your ability to control breathing. If this would happen, you could treat it temporarily by giving a hypertonic solution like mannitol or 3% saline in order to osmotically remove fluid from the swollen brain tissue and restore the cerebral blood supply. Anesthesia also can depress ventilation. We've all seen that a bolus of propofol or sufficient opioids can depress the activity of the respiratory center. There are many different kinds of disordered breathing. I just want to point out uh, a couple of them to you. Chain Stokes breathing is, called, is uh, an example of periodic breathing. Patients take deep breaths and then they have a period of apnea. So here you can see a patient taking deep breaths and then shallower, 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 no breath at all. And then they start to get deeper and deeper and deeper again. And the cycle repeats. This happens because they start to build up carbon dioxide. That makes them hyperventilate, which makes them drop their carbon dioxide. And then they hypoventilate and the cycle repeats over and over again. This is sort of like a roller coaster where they can't quite get things stabilized in equilibrium and they're swinging back and forth between two extremes. This graph demonstrates it where the PCO2 goes up in the blood and then the respiratory neurons experience the elevated PCO2 a little bit later, which makes your PCO2 go down, which makes the PCO2 of the respiratory neurons go down, and you can see we get this swinging back and forth. Patients who have severe heart failure and therefore slow circulation of blood may experience this lag um, and changes in CO2 and oxygen in the alveoli may persist for several seconds because the blood is flowing slowly. So they may have chain Stokes breathing. Also patients who have brain damage in their respiratory center may experience a temporary loss of their respiratory drive and then the CO2 goes up and then they have a forceful resp restoration of their respiratory drive which makes the CO2 go too low and again they get this pendulum like movement of the CO2 between too high and too low. We'll stop here. As always let me know if you have any questions and we'll continue with our discussion of pulmonary physiology in the next recording.